So I guess the moral of the story is, is that the solution to the problem only becomes apparent when you understand the problem. And that's why I've spent so much time analyzing the problem. And the problem is basically this, to define it, is that we're living on a planet that's vulnerable to periodic catastrophes. And that we're, we've learned, everything we've learned in the last 30 years has suggested not only the reality of those catastrophes, which was finally beginning to be accepted by the scientific world in 1980, but the ensuing evidence has led us to believe that the catastrophes are also quite frequent. It was, first of all, the big step was accept the reality of catastrophe. Well, then, okay, that's fine, we accept the reality of catastrophe, but this is something that only happens on the geological time scale, and it's nothing that humans on a human time scale have to worry about. Well, all of the evidence that has ensued in the last 30 years has completely confirmed what the ancient people said. And what Plato said is that there are recurring catastrophes. There have been many catastrophes through the history of the world, and there will continue to be many catastrophes. Now, if that is true, that is something that we need to be factoring in. You know, I mean, political leader, leaders need to be talking about that. When we make long-term projections about where our society is going to be 50 to 100 years from now, which obviously people, they do. I mean, Al Gore is talking about all the catastrophes that are going to occur if we don't curb CO2 emissions in the next 50 to 100 years. And we're supposed to reorient our entire society around preventing the increase of CO2 in our atmosphere. I mean... I will give it to Al Gore of this. Whether he's right or wrong, at least he's looking 100 years down the road and saying, yeah, we need to be cognizant of 100 years down the road. Well, the other point is, is that once we accept that catastrophes are real, that becomes, I believe, the, 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 the major thing that we need to be thinking about if we're going to be looking at the big picture. And your average person, day to day in their routines, don't look at the big picture. All you have to do is turn on the media and see that, the 99% of the media that's just complete trivial hogwash. But there are 1% to 5% of the people who have a spiritual responsibility to help bring this world to a place that it needs to be. Yes, Jerry. You talk about how the stuff comes in. How did those rocks get off of Mars and turn up into Antarctica? Rocks would have gotten off Mars because if you have a major collision with Mars, it injects chunks of Mars out into potential Earth-crossing orbits. Imagine you've got a, a, a two-mile or five-mile impactor into Mars, and Mars, much smaller, much smaller gravity field than Earth, you know, even in Earth, a large impact on Earth can send chunks of Earth's lithosphere out into orbit. It's going to do that even more so on Mars. So. A big impact hits Mars, leaves a huge crater, injects large amounts of debris out into, into the solar system, and Earth sweeps through it. That's it right there. I remember the day that I had the concept of something that would stay out and out of space. You know, in my lifetime, we hadn't, hadn't ever done that before, but in 1953, they were talking about doing it. Right. Well, yeah, so when I was born, we had not been in space. And probably, when, when were you were born, Paul? So we had just started getting into space when you were born. Yeah, in 53. No. When were you born? So we definitely weren't in space in the 40s. But you know the irony of it is, is World War II helped propel us into the space program. So maybe there was a, some kind of a bloodletting that had to be necessary to help move us to the next stage of our evolution. Okay, this is where we left off last time, with the secret of the cosmic fire. I gave you this as a handout, right? And you all, you, you memorized it, right? Went backwards. backwards. Okay, that's even better. Um, we will skip through this because this is where we left it, and I'll get here to the last.
Play-Doh. And then at the usual period, the stream from heaven descends like a pestilence. You think Plato could be referring to some ancient doctrine about repeated catastrophes? I would say so. Okay, so we learned that comets um, traditionally have been associated with great fires. And here's the evidence. I mean, there's tons of this stuff. If you begin to research the history of comets, you see that they are associated with catastrophic floods and catastrophic fires both. And in fact, scientifically, we could, it's very plausible that comets would be responsible for both of those phenomena. And then we got to this, this is I think where we left it, was I showed you Hayakotake. When, when the scientists analyzed Hayakotake, they discovered that it contains abundant ethane and methane as well as uh, C2H2, which is acetylene. So here, Comet Hayukataki, once we were able to have the technology to analyze with accuracy the composition of a comet, the first comet that comes in, we, we look at it, and what does it contain? It contains concentrated, abundant, flammable gases, methane, ethane, and acetylene. And this is what I am proposing as the means by which these flammable gases can be delivered to Earth's atmosphere. Uh, I'm calling this a cosmic hydrocarbon delivery system. If you ever look up methane hydrates on the internet, you'll find a lot of interesting information about um, carbon atoms being encased within a lattice work of, of water, within a water molecule. And this could very, very likely be a credible way by which a comet could deliver um, flammable gases to Earth's atmosphere. Now, in the case of the Peshtigo fires and the Hinkley fires and the Chicago fire, what you had was the, you have to have the appropriate matrix. You have to have the appropriate environment in which to introduce this so that the gases can become concentrated. If the comet came in, let's say it broke up over an ocean, you're probably going to have no effect of it. Uh, if it comes in and it breaks up, you know, during a, uh, you know, over the jet stream and the stuff immediately is dispersed, there's probably going to be no concentration enough to where it can achieve flammability within the atmosphere. But if you have the conditions such as prevailed over the Midwest in the 1871, you know, you have these very stagnant weather conditions, low pressure, you introduce this, this stuff into the atmosphere, it's very possible that it could accumulate. So this is where it kind of connects with the idea of sacred geometry. This is a fullerene here, the dodecahedral molecular structure of a methane hydrate. And I would also recommend reading uh, the myth of Phaeton, or Phaeton, if you will. Um, this would be a good one to go through. I don't think we've ever read this together. From Manilius, um, the five books of Manilius containing a system of ancient astronomy and astrology. This was from a 1697 translation. Now, we've all heard of the, the myth of Phaeton, right? Um, this is what, what, what happened, what was the myth of Phaeton before I go on? What was it? Paul, what was the myth of Phaeton in a couple of sentences? Do you remember? Myth of Phaeton, Jeremy? Son of Helios. Well, it's a Greek myth, but it conceals uh, a story. And anyway, so here's a was an ancient commentary on the myth of Phaeton. This was once the path where Phoebus drove. Now what is Phoebus? The sun. Another name for the sun. Phoebus is another name for the sun. This was once the path where Phoebus drove and that in length of years the heated track took fire and burnt the stars. The color changed, the ashes strewed the way, and still preserved the marks of the decay. What would that be referring to? The comet breaking up leaves its meteor stream. The meteor stream still preserves the path of the decaying comet. Exactly. Besides, fame tells, by fame, by age, fame reverend grown. That's awkward wording, but what he's saying is that 
as this, as this tale has been told, it has grown in reverence. That Phoebus gave his chariot to his son, and whilst the youngster from the path declines, admiring the strange beauty of the signs, and if you read, play, uh, if you read the myth of Phaeton, what signs does he see? The signs of the zodiac, right? Admiring the strange beauty of the signs, proud of his charge, he drove the fiery horse and would outdo his father in his course. The north grew warm, and the unusual fire dissolved its snow and made the bears retire. I don't think it could get more explicit than that, could it? <laughs> the north grew warm, and the unusual fire dissolved its snow. Nor was the earth secure. Each country mourned the common fate, and in its cities burned. Then from the scattered chariot, lightning came, and we've learned the chariot is often a symbol for the comet. Then from the scattered chariot, lightning came, and the whole skies were one continued flame. The world took fire, and in new kindled stars, the bright remembrance of its fate it bears. Now, I have the, the whole skies were one continued flame. I have that underlined because what does that bring to mind? What images in the, in the, well, in the eyewitness accounts of the Hinckley fire and the Peshtigo fire and the Chicago fire, what did they describe over and over again? The whole sky was one continued flame. And the world took fire. And what is that? I've got the second thing. In new kindled stars. Well, what would that be? Well, that's the meteors, exactly, exactly. The bright remembrance of its fate it bears. Now, you will recall, I have a section of the Phaeton myth here. The clouds begin to smoke and the mountaintops take fire. Now, remember in the accounts of the Peshtigo fire and the other great fires, remember it was the hilltops and the treetops that started burning first? They said the fire came out of the sky. Let's see. Great cities perished with their walls and towers. Whole nations with their people were consumed to ashes. The forest-clad mountains burned. Now, great cities perished. Well, I've said that we can look for modern analogs, and Chicago is one of those, is a modern example of a great city perishing in a cosmic fire. And then, of course, um, it finally, the clues are abundant. Phaeton, with his hair on fire, fell headlong, Phaeton. And we know that the word comet means what, literally? Elizabeth, comet means long-haired, long-haired. That's what comet, the word comet means Greek. It's Greek, and it means long-haired. Okay, so then we, we talked about... The Draconid meteor shower, right? Draconid meteor shower peaking on the 7th, 8th, and 9th of October. And in, in this, what I have done is I have gathered together a lot of information about the Draconid meteor shower. Um, and its effects on people and so forth. Um, so we'll go through that. I'm not going to read all that, even though it's extremely interesting. And you should read it yourself. Here is the Radiant of the Draconid. For those of you that haven't seen this. Uh, I think so, but I don't, I don't know. Okay. So here is Draco, the constellation in the night sky. October 9th. See that little cross right there? That represents the Radiant of the Draconid meteor shower. Photograph of the Peekskill fireball. This is, notice the date, October 9th. Now this is the kind of stuff that the Draconids like to throw at the earth. Multiple fireballs. And there are some very, if you go online and you write in, you type in Peekskill, you can get about eight or ten video clips that people took of this particular fireball right here, and it's worth doing. So for those of you who are serious researchers and not just dilettantes, write that down, peak skill, and look it up online. 
and you'll be able to get some you'll get some really cool videos to look at because there's about three or four of them that the, the, the meteor has passed right over a football stadium during a high school football game. And so people there were people sitting in the audience filming the football game and then the meteors go overhead and you know so they switch and they they got the meteors. But the meteors were seen over a track of many hundreds of miles. So peak skill, look that up and you'll be able to get probably eight or ten video clips. There's a photograph of the night sky. You're looking north. Um, Draco is a circumpolar constellation. Here's the head of the dragon right here. And there's the radiant. So in the next image, I'm showing the traditional depiction. It's the same stars that you're seeing right here. And here's the dragon's head. Well, like here, okay, the Peshtigo fire page. This is an interesting. Now, this you can go to this if you want to write this down, Oconto County. There it is, the W.E. Gen Web Project, and they have some interesting information about the Peshtigo fire. There's nothing on there that I haven't already shown you. Now, notice that they start the fires in the dry fields and wooded areas. But now, let's suppose that the Earth is passing through a region of space where a concentrated, where there's a concentration of gas discharged from, from a decaying comet. And let's say that Earth has been accreting, you see like it takes three full days for the Earth tra to traverse the Draconid shower. Maybe even longer. It takes at least two weeks for the Earth to traverse the Torrid meteor shower. Right? Now there's some, like when we get into the details of the Tunguska event, we discover some interesting stuff. Is that people were noticing um, strange lights actually in the atmosphere several days before the explosion. That was reported. Well, that would probably be an indication that there was actually probably a gaseous tail associated with the torrid with the Tunguska object, and if you remember, if you remember your lessons on comets that I've taught you, the tail points away from the sun. And which direction did the Tunguska object come from? From towards the sun. So if there was a gaseous tail, that tail would have preceded the object and actually intersected the Earth prior to the explosion of the object itself. Now, in the case of the Great Fires of 1871. I would suggest that it's plausible that we maybe had an accretion of gas that took place over several days prior to the influx of the fireballs. So, the, and, and this is what people reported. People reported like several days before the outbreak of fire, smelling gas out in the woods, smelling gas. People were reporting smelling gas in the basements of buildings in Chicago a day and two days before the outbreak of the fire. And they had no source of where this gas was coming from. Unless, you know, again, it was accumulating. It's been conjectured that, the, that marsh gas might have been responsible for some of the fires in, in Peshtigo. But again, marsh gas is not going to cause the entire firmament to become enveloped in flames. Well, yeah, it sure does. Well, what you smell, when you smell gas gas, you're not actually smelling the gas. What you're smelling is the stuff that the gas company puts in there because it's a purified gas and it has no real smell. So they put this stuff in it that, that you smell. But marsh gas is loaded with methane. <laughs> so with the tinder dry conditions present throughout the entire region on the night of October 8, 1871, such a meteor shower would ha easily have started what seemed like spontaneous fires in numerous places. And this is true. However, even with tinder dry conditions would have it turned into a conflagration that would have set the sky on fire. I think not. But if the gas, the source of the gas was the sky, it may be a whole different... Okay, so... Um, and then, in, in further confirmation of the plausibility of it, we have this recent research from four years ago by Chandrawik Ramasinghe, where he's surmising that some comets are not visible, and that there may be comets or pieces of comets which are composed of, of uh, 
material that we can't that hasn't have no reflectivity. So they could actually come into the atmosphere completely undetected. How could it be? What? How could it be? How could it be what? Well, right here it says the team has found that the surfaces of inactive comets, if composed of loose, fluffy, organic material, like cometary meteoroids, develop such small reflectivities they appear invisible. The near-Earth objects may therefore be dominated by a population of fast, kilometers-wide bodies too dark to be seen with current surveys. Now here is a interesting aside. This is, I haven't shown you this, this is from, from 10 years ago, but it's still correct. A million year record of fire in sub-Saharan Africa. See what he says, biomass, meaning plant material, biomass burning today constitutes approximately one third of annual anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Anthropogenic means what? By man. By man. CO2 is carbon dioxide, right? And there is a sound theoretical base for expecting fire-related changes in vegetation patterns to affect climate. But despite the central role that fire has played in molding many modern ecosystems, there is little information on the incidence of fire before the earliest time at which anthropogenic burning may have significantly affected natural fire regimes. Here, we present a million year record of elemental carbon abundance from marine sediments, which you were just saying, on the Sierra Leone rise downwind of sub-Saharan Africa. Elemental carbon serves as a proxy for wind blow debris derived from the combustion of sub-Saharan vegetation. The inferred fire incidence in the region was low until about 400,000 years ago, but since that time, intense episodes of vegetation fires occurred during periods, notice, when climate was changing from interglacial to glacial mode. I, I can't even emphasize how significant I think that is. The fact that there are these intense fires, forest fires, burning up biomass at the same time the earth is going into a glacial mode. Because they're blaming it on humans <coughs> just like they said they extincted the mammoth. Well, we couldn't blame this on humans going back 400,000 years ago, I wouldn't. Is it just a cyclical correspondence? In yes, what, what he's saying here is that they've noticed that for in the last 400,000 years, there are these episodes of intense vegetation fires, and they seem to be occurring at the same time that the climate shifts from interglacial, such as it is now, into glacial. So what's the, what's, what's the connecting... Well, something is, something is triggering those fires. Something has to be triggering those fires. And those, you know, so if, if, like what Paul just said, if it is something from space, it's not only triggering fires, it's probably also injecting dust into the atmosphere. Um, but we have comets more than every, I mean, we have comets regularly buzzing our planet, don't we? Not every 6,000 years or however the... Well, it's one thing if a comet goes by a half a million or a million miles away. Well, I'm talking about closer. I mean, you know, we see them. Uh, well, I don't know. Well, Comet Hayukutaki was about a million miles away. And that was considered cl fairly close. Well, they have fires in the Okanoki Swamp, but don't they think it's lightning that starts them? I would think so. And, and now, see, the Okanoki Swamp might, in fact, be, you know, swamp gas fires. But bear in mind, remember in the Hinkley fire, they described the fire column as being five miles in height? You're not going to have swamp, you're not going to have methane outgassing from a swamp producing a flame column five miles high. And then we have, from 1995, technology review. Recent studies have shown that a host of fair-sized pieces could have a more devastating global consequences than a single winter-causing object by igniting many separate conflagrations that merge into a global firestorm. So see, when the ancients talked about ekporosis, they were talking about globally destructive fires. Well, up until the last 20 or 30 years, no scientist even conceived of such a thing. And yet now, 
we realize it's totally consistent with the scientific evidence that such a thing could in fact happen. And this, it, See, what he's saying here, a single winter causing object, that would be like one big object that comes in, slams into the earth, causes so much dust to encircle the earth that it plunges us into a glacial age. That's what he means by winter. The, an ice age being a, a winter. Um, and this is what, you know, was kind of, remember uh, nuclear winter in the 80s? Well, remember the nuclear winter studies came from the initial studies of what would be the climatic consequences of an asteroid impact. And it, when, it's, when it injects simultaneously dust and soot into the atmosphere, it, it makes the atmosphere opaque to the penetration of the sun's heat and light, and therefore could plunge the earth into a glacial age. See, and then looking at that, they're going, well, geez, if, if an asteroid could do that, what would nuclear bombs detonating do? So actually the nuclear winter we heard so much about during the 80s actually was an outgrowth of thinking about the consequences of asteroid impacts onto Earth. Okay, now we have the angel. Oh, I showed, you guys haven't seen this, but when I did my Halloween talk, I want to show you something here. Um, there it is. So this is my updated Festival of the Dead, which I've shown you some of, but I've never shown you the whole interesting story. Yeah, you're right, Elizabeth. I need to write a book, and then one of the requirements would be that everybody reads the damn thing. Here we go. The devil. Notice what the devil holds in his hand. The same thing the angel, the, the, the destroying angel holds in his hand in the other tarot card image. And um, notice what he has on his belly. What is that the sign of? Taurus, yes. What's the connection? Well, it does look like Mercury because it's sitting on top of a cross. But if you actually look at it, that's, you know, you've got the Templar cross right there. And on top of it is the sign for Taurus. If you look at this symbol for Mercury, it's a little different. But this was how often they drew the sign for Taurus, like this with one continuous. Mm -hmm. So, what's the connection with Taurus right there? The Taurids, exactly, exactly. And this whole Day of the Dead presentation is about the Taurids. And this was the introduction to you know, the Christian concept of the devil, which I'm suggesting is totally different from what most most Christians imagine it to be. Man what? The devil's a man right, but initially it was a symbol. The devil was a symbol. And this, this, what I've done here, I don't think you've seen this before, but this is an analysis of the, some of the original Greek in Hebrew describing sa Satan and Lucifer and the fall of Lucifer. We'll save that for another one, another time. It was not my intent to digress off into the torrid meteor shower right now. I just wanted to show you that image of the devil and how it had the same element as this. Now of course here the destroying angel is shown with the flaming torch in one hand and the pitcher of water. So what we have here is the symbol for the ekporosis which is this, and the cataclysmos, the, the destruction of the world by water, symbolized here. And then, of course, we have two signs of the zodiac, which would be Leo and Scorpio, the eagle. See, in, in Aquarius, the symbology, the water is the universal womb, and the glyph is the thought behind creation. Oh, sure, and, I, and none of what I'm saying denies that that's a legitimate interpretation. What you have to bear in mind with occult symbology is that the meanings are layered. There are moral meanings, there are scientific meanings, there are meanings, there are metaphysical meanings, and there are physical. There's the metaphysics of it, then there's the physics of it. On one level, what we're talking about here is and what I you know, the way I look at the tarot cards is that the tarot cards represent essentially the a symbolic way of representing the cosmic history of the world. Yeah, and you've got one, and that's straight out of the book of Revelations with the angel having one foot on land and one foot in the water. But see, it's the same thing. I mean, the, the Christian concept of the, the, the baptism is about the rebirth out of the waters, and it definitely represents. See, to the occult philosopher, 
You look at the analogies in nature. The breaking of the water at the time of birth is the same as the breaking of the fountains of the great deep on, on a macro level. And, and the rebirth of a new age of the world, accompanied by the breaking of the water, which is the, the breaking up of the fountains of the great deep. So what you're saying, you, it's in, you know, in metaphysics and occult philosophy, to say that a symbol has one meaning doesn't then exclude that there are other meanings as well. And to get to the whole essence of it, you take all those meanings. So, yeah, when you talk about the Great Flood, certainly there is a component that, that associates with the baptism, the immersion in the water, because that's what the Great Flood was. It was the immersion of the water, of the world, into the water, in the rebirth of a new age of the world coming out of that water. The baptism is the same thing, except you are reenacting in the individual microcosm this rebirth out of the waters of the flood. And so you're immersed into the water. And, and the analogy has been made by the ancient commentators between the great flood and the breaking of the waters, the breaking of the, and the, the discharge of the amniotic fluid. And I think that's a perfectly valid, valid correlation because it does represent the idea on the individual scale of, you know, the... the the emergence into a, a new realm of being, a birth, if you will, and that's how they saw, the ancient people saw that connection between the waters that accompanied the birth of, of new life, new human life, and the waters that accompanied the, the birth of a new world age.